Uh, my name is Robert Nashak. I'm EVP of Digital Entertainment and Games for BBC Worldwide. Um, BBC is the, one of the largest media companies in the world. In the UK, it's a public service that's funded by taxpayer dollars and a license fee that you pay to own your television. Um, BBC Worldwide is the commercial arm of the BBC, and that's who I work for. And I'll tell you a little bit about our company now, if I can get this to work. So my agenda real quick, I'm going to do a very quick intro to BBC Worldwide, and then I want to talk generally about how media companies are rethinking the role of games, particularly in the West. Um, I also want to talk about how multi-platform uh, intellectual property development, brand development, is impacting games deals. I want to talk about the changes in TV consumption in the West and the way that's impacting the way games are thought of. And also want to talk about transmedia and what's happening in that space. And then, I'll, and then just lead on a, uh, end on a small note around games analytics and its importance for TV. But this is really a session just to kind of give you, a, give you a taste of how media companies are thinking about games right now. So BBC Worldwide, we're a global organization with offices around the world, including Singapore, Hong Kong, and Beijing. Um, big in initiative for us moving forward in Tokyo, but also around Asia to sort of become more of a uh, presence with not only BBC News, but some of the brands that we, uh, we hold true uh, to our dearest hearts. So in terms of BBC's global media presence, we have a variety of businesses. One is channels business, where we uh, have about 40 plus channels operating around the globe, including BBC America in the US, but channels in Asia as well. Content and production, where we actually produce our own TV shows and distribute them. Global brands, where we take our we take brand management very seriously, and we actually take our brands and sort of try to maximize them across a variety of platforms, from licensed consumer products on. Sales and distribution is huge for us. Outside the Hollywood majors, we are the largest distributor of television content. Um, in the world today, um, having a lot of success currently in the U.S. Last year on iTunes, um, Top Gear, our car entertainment franchise, um, was the number one most downloaded television series in the U.S. Uh, Doctor Who, our sci-fi brand, was number six. So having good success there. And we also have good success in home entertainment and, and magazines. Digital, however, runs across the entire business, and I want to talk a little bit about that today. Our portfolio of brands, uh, you know, flagship being BBC News, obviously, but we have a bunch of entertainment brands as well that are well over uh, ha uh, 50 million pounds each. So here's some of the brands, some of which you know, some of which you don't know. Probably all of you know in some manifestation Teletubbies. It's one of many kids' properties that BBC is known for, and we're doing deals right now in Asia to bring Teletubbies across all platforms. One of our biggest brands is Top Gear. Has anyone here heard of Top Gear? Yeah, it's the car entertainment brand. Uh, it's a huge show around the world. It's in uh, like 175 different territories. Um, uh, and we have also local formats that we produce in the US, South Korea, and China. So it's a big brand for us. Dancing with the Stars, has anyone heard of that? Yeah, that's ours. It's a dancing show that started out in the UK. Now there are, it's in you know, hundred, uh, over 100 territories. And there are literally 40 local versions produced around the world, including <laughs> South Korea and China. So um, a huge brand for us. And it is indeed the largest entertainment brand in the world right now in terms of just its reach. Planet Earth, in general, BBC has the largest natural history unit in the world. So natural history is a big part of what we do. Nature is part of what we do. And our big sci-fi brand, Doctor Who, is big for us. And it's going to be big in Asia. It's coming soon, so watch for that. Uh, just wanted to show you screenshots of how Dancing with the Stars and Top Gear kind of manifest themselves in Asia. Um, and then we've got a game coming out called Dancing with the Stars Keep Dancing that will heavily localize across all the territories where the, where the show is popular. Um, we founded a games unit. I came over from EA. Prior to that, I was at Yahoo. Um, we founded the games division in 2010 um, with teams in Los Angeles, London, New York, and hopefully soon Asia. Uh, and we hired up people from both the startup world and also the branded entertainment world because we do believe in brands. And we think um, media companies in general are using their brands to rethink the role of games in their uh, sort of you know, revenue portfolio. So traditionally, how have media companies thought of brands, right? So, or t excuse me, thought of games. So this is a movie example. The first spike is a trailer of the movie coming out. The second is when the movie launches. The third is when the DVD happens. Then the broadcast is, or sequels happens. These spikes are when these, these sort of traditional entertainment brands get their most awareness. Traditionally, games have been, has been, have been used as a way of leveling off those products, um, product spikes. 
not only in terms of revenue, but also customer engagement. So even when marketing is not huge around your brand, games are attracting community and players and people engaging with your brand. We think, however, that games can do much more than that. And sort of there are three buckets in which we think about games and entertainment brands. The first is games really can create new strategic gateways into existing brands. So for example, we don't just launch a game around Dancing with the Stars. What we try to do is launch what will become the largest community online around Dancing with the Stars and use games as a way to both drive sort of like more, more people into the brand, but also new kinds of ways to, for people to interact around the brands in an in a, in a engaging way. Um, secondly, games can really impact new brand development. Right now, we're engaged in a number of sort of like um, projects where we're working with brand new properties to think from the ground up a 360 digital strategy around them even before the first script is written. And that's a huge priority for us. And that's a trend we think is going to be uh, continuing for a while um, moving forward. And then online and mobile, mobile games. These, these services online and mobile, they really can drive a ton of engagement around brands. And it's a big priority for us. to launch. We just launched a games vertical on topgear.com. And we'll be doing the same on bbc.com soon. So what are some of the opportunities for brands in a growing but fragmented market? We're actually, we have activity in our short two years across all of these areas, including console, social, casual online, and mobile tablet. Um, but what's really interesting to me is what we've been doing to take advantage of the fact that our intellectual property is truly multi-format. Let me give you an example. So Top Gear. Top Gear, again, is that big car entertainment show that we have. We've now launched games across almost every major platform. Um, uh, Top Gear Stunt School Revolution will be a sequel to a game that we did um, two years ago. It's, it's right now being piloted in Australia and New Zealand, and it'll be localized around the world in uh, June. Um, but that's a fun uh, racing game that we think has done really well for us. We've got a Top Gear social game coming out on the top uh, on Facebook in next month. We did a big deal with Microsoft that I'll tell you about in a second. And then we also do a lot with our, on our web and social sites around Top Gear and gaming. Um, one of the bigger deals we did was with Microsoft. We did a partnership where we took the brand Top Gear and we actually integrated into their big racing franchise called Forza, Forza um, for Forza 4, which came out last year for Xbox. Microsoft was interested in having us uh, ha expanding their user base beyond the core racing sim fan um, and reaching a wider audience. We had that wider audience, so what we did is we partnered. They integrated tons of Top Gear elements into the game. So for example, the studio that's on the show, the Top Gear test track, the, the Stig, and it turned out to be a huge success for both parties. And what made it successful is that the brand, that's, the Top Gear, is not just a TV brand, it's a multi-format brand. And so the way we believe to succeed in this media landscape in the gaming business is to be able to have brands that touch a variety of different parts of the ecosystem. So not only do we have a big online presence, we have a Facebook presence, we're on iTunes, uh, YouTube, we do lots of licensing and publishing, we even have live events. And when we went into this relationship with Microsoft, we actually activated our audience across all those different formats around the game. And so, you know, we're not out there needing to buy out advertising all the time. It's actually sort of we have a lot of in, you know, homegrown audience that we can activate around our games. And I think that's a trend you'll see moving forward. So after all this gaming activity, we've now established Top Gear, you know, very much firmly as, as a gaming brand, right? Um, some, some examples is we actually integrated the Forza racing game onto the U.S. version of Top Gear. So two of the presenters were racing on the Infineon racetrack in the game while one was actually on the Infineon racetrack racing and the, and, and the, the, game, the, the contest was to see who would win. The guy driving on the real racetrack won, I, I hasten to say. Um, but we had a big E3 presence. Um, we did a lot for the video game awards around this. So a lot, a lot of um, um, PR impressions and some really good buzz around Top Gear and now very much sort of associated with gaming. Another example is Doctor Who. It's a sci-fi brand. It's one of the longest in the world. It actually is the, is the longest running um, sci-fi brand in the world. And just an example of two ways we've manifested um, Doctor Who. Uh, I'll show you in a second. Let me, I want to show you a couple of videos. So Doctor Who has been around for like 47 years. We've got two games right now. This, this first game is about to be launched on Sony, Vita, and PS. Peggy 12. So too loud. Alert! The Doctor has returned! This thing has enormous power. 
never seen anything like it. The clock is pulling down to pieces, unwinding history itself. We've got to stop this. Hello, sweetie. Why do our dates always end in the destruction of the universe? All the best monsters love the city of London. No time to stop. We need to keep moving. What could they want with a piece of the eternity clock? The timelines are still in flux. The storm is tearing time to pieces in here. I don't know how much longer we can take this. We are running out of time, literally. We've got to get back to the TARDIS River. Keep lasting and I'll keep solid. We need to stop the clock. If your history is wiped clean. You can't Okay, so that's an example of our brand coming into console in a very realistic way. We worked with the show creators, we actually got the talent to do motion capture for us, and voice obviously. Um, one manifestation of a brand in the game space. Welcome to Here's a universe another in disarray, with rather too many monsters in the mix. It can all lead to world destruction, but you can help save the universe with Doctor Who, Worlds in Time. The universe is in a spot of bother, and by spot, I mean huge, disastrous, end of everything kind of bother. This time, the Doctor needs your help. Come and join our adventures in time and space. Visit distant worlds. Solve mind-boggling puzzles. And perhaps your friends can assist. Grab your sonic screwdriver. Travel in the TARDIS. In the first ever Doctor Who online multiplayer game. And take an adventure in time to save the universe. Okay, again, very same brand, a very different look and feel for a different platform. You know, doing our best to very much sort of like um, bring our our uh, properties to um, games wherever possible. Incidentally, we're actually working with the BBC News team to create news games. Uh, uh, we were helped by our friend Ian Bogus, who wrote a book called News Games. And so, even on the news side, we're trying to take advantage of it. Upcoming, we have a Walking with Dinosaurs movie coming out. Walking with Dinosaurs was the first CGI dinosaur documentary. We're rebooting it as an entertainment brand. It comes out in October 13 as a movie. Um, he, this is a shot from the live show where we have large animatronic um, dinosaurs that sell out stadia around the world, um, outselling things like Lady Gaga, for example. And you can imagine like a 360 approach, we've got a lot of activity coming out with the movie. So we're working with the creatives right now to make sure that the launch is actually done in a cohesive way. So that's kind of sort of the way what's happening from a brand perception. What I wanted to give you a taste of is some of the things that are changing, what some of the changes that are happening, primarily in the West, around the way games are thought of um, as TV consumption changes. So the television landscape in the US, and, and, and this is true in, as well in Europe, 29% of under 25 year olds get most of their TV online. 50% of TV view happens, viewing happens with a computer in use. Divided attention experiences are finally getting their due, and that means second screen applications like on iPad, where you're actually following along on your iPad as the television show um, shows. And then 76 of all TVs in the US will be connected by 2015. So this idea of you know, interactive television is actually sort of almost going to happen. In the long term, Cisco projects that this is what TV will look like. Um, channels will go away, creation will go viral, ads will get personal targeted to you, TVs will give way to screens now, um, we'll watch together virtually, social viewing is a big trend right now, it's already happening, we've been meeting with companies in Asia that are all about sort of creating social viewing experiences around TV, regular Joes go Hollywood, meaning user generated content will be more important, um, people won't just watch TV, they'll get involved, they'll kiss the remote goodbye, goodbye to the remote, we'll have other systems, and then TV goes with you on your mobile devices. A lot of that's already happening. But what's getting everyone right now in the media world fixated is the fact that... Too bad. Is that better? 
All right. Is the fact that our attention is uh, fragmented, right? Everyone watching television right now, at least 50% of the people, are actually um, doing other things. If you look at the orange um, uh, dot, that's daily usage of people watching TV and also simultaneously using their tablet, their smartphone, and their e-reader. So in this landscape, television companies like ours are very much focused in on how do you how do you actually map, you know take advantage of that fact um, and and maximize for it because really the, what's happening in the advertising space is the money's going more and more away from television into the digital space as this graph shows. So second screen apps, these are tablet apps usually, but sometimes online, are becoming bigger and bigger in the US and Europe. And basically they are just glorified websites with social features. So for example, they have video clips, sometimes full episodes, photos, blogs, alerts, social network features as well. Um, and we think that that's a trend that's going to continue and grow um, and, and make its way into other markets. We already know this is happening in India. But the marketplace in this is already very much crowded. Zbox is one of many companies doing this right now. Um, so it's becoming a very sort of crowded space. What I like to do is think beyond that just simple second screen app, which is basically trying to keep you engaged with the TV show as you're watching it. And what's interesting to us is, is there really an opportunity to do transmedia? And that's an overused term, but let's try to like w give you a sense of what that's like. Don't worry about the crazy graph on the, on the left. But what is transmedia? Well, we look at it as having certain criteria. One is, it's on, you know, a property is manifest on multiple platforms. It's a single true story, not a theme. It's an actual narrative that goes across many platforms. Each piece of content uniquely contributes to the whole not just, it's not, it, it actually participates back into the entire experience. And the content is created and de delivered organically and developed organically. And this vision of sort of transmedia, if interactive TV takes off, this will become, I think, more and more common and we're investing in it already. So there's some examples of it already happening out there in the world. We've seen it with shows like Lost, but alternative reality games, sorry for the spelling, digital games, mobisodes, minisodes, webisodes, animated web series, web comics, graphic novels, prequels, and spin-offs. A lot of this stuff is happening already, but it's early days yet. I was just talking two weeks ago to the creator of Heroes, the television show, and he's, he, his production company is completely focused in on this right now um, as, a, as his sort of a primary uh, um, uh, primary business model moving forward. Who's doing this already? Well, a lot's happening in the States. You've got the Sci-Fi Channel um, doing stuff around Red Faction, Defiance. Game of Thrones has done a lot around it as well. Um, we did something really interesting last summer, and we had a TV show called Torchwood that was a spin-off of Doctor Who. Doctor Who. Torchwood is actually an anagram for Doctor Who. Um, and the show launched in Stars in America, BBC One, and we created a motion comic game hybrid application for iOS that we started building before the first script was written. We had the show writers write this, we had the show talent voice it, and as the show aired on TV, this got, each week we released a new version of this interactive episode that extended the story and extended the experience beyond it. And while we're all like rushing around trying to sort of get our iOS games sort of like uh, featured on Apple and all that, we are also trying to sort of do more innovative stuff, linking our media properties to what's happening in the digital space, and that's just one example. So a good definition of transmedia from Henry Jenkins, worth reading. Transmedia represents a strategy for telling stories where there is part a particularly diverse set of characters, where the world is richly realized, and where there is a strong backstory or mythology that can extend beyond the specific episodes being depicted in the film or television series. And we're doing our level best to really sort of drive that home moving forward, and we think that's a trend that'll happen around the world. Let me give you an example, just a creative example off the top of our heads, right? So imagine an online experience that's developed as also a TV experience. Um, maybe it's a procedural crime drama, right? Imagine there's a stakeout happening um, uh, and there's an interactive narrative being developed. You are on the stakeout, like a policeman or something, police person, and you get a set of binoculars, but the binoculars are not working. You spend money on new binoculars, this is the freemium model, or you grab a friend on Facebook to come to the scene and effectively extend your field of vision. Not a lot of people are telling stories yet this way. How compelling would that be, however? 
Um, so the scale of the internet makes these kind of things meaningful in new ways. And this is what alternative reality games already taught us, that distributed computing within your social graph can work. And if you're looking at the future of games moving forward, particularly around media properties, uh, look no further. I think this is a real reality that we'll be seeing in the coming years. So one last point I wanted to make before I stop is that, you know, it's, it's, it's it's becoming cliche to say that games sort of are data-driven and analytics-driven, but it's really true. The games in, in the industry is sort of the most data-driven industry in the media landscape right now. And part of our role at PBC as a games team is to actually inject the rest of the company with that sense of the importance of data. Um, and uh, you know they rely on sort of rating services and all that. We can actually really drive deeper. So the analytics that we do in game give a good indication of what's popular about a TV show, and then we then feed that back to the television producers, and that, and that can impact the show. But one small little thing, which I think is funny, and I just want to end on, is um, around Doctor Who, which is that sci-fi brand. We actually developed a Twitter analytics platform called Candle. And what this platform does is does uh, sentiment analysis around the world for all tweets happening at any given time around this brand called Doctor Who. Um, and here's an example. So at any, this is a snapshot of time. So these are all people tweeting at any given moment around Doctor Who. And the faces correspond to the sort of the sentiment of their tweet, whether it's positive, negative, or neutral. So we can actually, in certain instances, geolocate those tweets. So on the left, you see we geolocated a tweet to England, uh, to Europe, I mean, now to England, and now to a, peer, a place just west of London. We actually can say, this is the place where the person is tweeting from. How scary and weird is that, right? Obviously, we won't use this data, but if, uh, evil people will, I'm sure, but not us. Uh, here's my favorite, though. We found an actual person tweeting live from a trailer park in New Mexico. Um, anyway, what do you do with this kind of data? So, for example, um, there's a lot you could do with it. First of all, we're finding a lot of cool information out of tweet, tweet, tweeting. Um, so, for example, correlations between people tweeting about Doctor Who and eating ice cream. We immediately called the sales team up and said, you got to do a deal with an ice cream maker. Um, but also, you know, fantasy ideas would be, we know people in a certain area are very focused in on the show. Definitely put billboards up in that area, because so, we know that they'll be engaged around it. Or we could even shape the kind of advertising around sort of what the t uh, tweet analysis analysis tells us, right? So you get, there's a richness here that um, com comes um, when you actually are analytics driven. And where our hope is that, uh, you know, in the games team, we impact our media company. Not only to think in terms of 360 and interactive and all the ways brands can manifest, but also to be more data driven in its approach. So that was my agenda. Went through it really quickly. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for your time. And if you need to reach me, that's my contact information. And more than happy to take any questions.